Check, yes. Yeah, those of us who are coming to this ministry, because of the fact that we are so exposed to the teaching of the word of God, God is going to hold us accountable. We will be held at a higher level of accountability because of the fact that we are studying the word of God. And if we, um, as the Bible said, if we sin willfully, if we mess up willfully, having, you know, when we go through all of these things that we are discussing here, having all of this understanding, we're supposed to put them into operation. We're supposed to practice them. And it's a way for us to improve on the way how we live. Praise the Lord. And we want to give God thanks. Praise God. Amen. We will pick up today in 1st Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And today we will jump right into uh, verse 8. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here. And as we open up the Holy Word of God for another time, we want to feed on your words today, Lord. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will open up our eyes, our ears. You will energize us. God, I pray we will become excited. We will become hungry for the Word of God. I pray for clarity. I pray, Lord, for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, even as we break bread today, Lord. Pray that you bless your people, heal our bodies, heal our soul, our mind, and our spirit. Have your way, Lord, in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Praise the Lord. Now we continue our discussion uh, in the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. In chapter 7, we see where the Apostle Paul is dealing with the Corinthians church. There was immorality uh, that was going on in the Corinthians church when we do a study of the Corinthians church, we see that the Corinthians church, they had all of the gifts of the spirit that was manifesting in the Corinthians church. And uh, in spite of the fact that they have all of the gifts of the spirit that was manifesting in the church, they also have all kinds of different sins that was taking place in the church. And uh, at this particular time here, Paul was dealing with immorality that was in the church. There was a brother in the Corinthians church who was uh, living or he take away his father's wife and he was in a relationship with his father's wife and uh, the Corinthians church, the leadership of the church failed to discipline, um, you know, the brother. And I guess they turned a blind eye figuring that they were tolerant and they did not want to um, discipline this brother so Paul, he sent off a painful letter, a letter of rebuke, sent a letter of rebuke by Titus uh, because the Corinthian church, Paul went there to visit one time and they, they treat Paul in a bad way. Paul was abused and it seemed as though he had to leave town. He had to run out of town. <laughs> and, you know, because of the fact he was the, the one who... Um, established the church, he cared about the church and he loved the Corinthians. And even though they run him out of town, more, more or less, he didn't give up on them. So what he did, he wrote this letter of rebuke, painful letter, but it's not, this letter is not in the, in the, in the Bible. I, uh, they said it was lost. But this painful letter, he sent this painful letter to rebuke them and to tell them that they have to um, discipline uh, the brother who was living with his father's wife, who took away his father's wife, and to, you know, put him out of the fellowship so that his body uh, will be destroyed and his spirit, his soul saved in the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as he sent off that letter, Paul was, he, he was sorry because of the fact that he sent off the letter. He said, uh, you know, like sometimes you do something and you say, what have I done? What, did I do the right thing? And as he rushed the letter off, he clicked in his mind, did I do the, wrong, the right thing? And uh, he was sorry in a way that he sent the letter off. So this is where we are picking up today in verse 8. He said, for though I made you sor sorry when with a letter or epistle, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceived that the same epistle had made you sorry. 
though it were but for a season. So Paul sent off this letter of rebuke, and it was a painful letter. And as he sent out the letter, he probably said to himself, I wonder what, what kind of reception the Corinthian church is going to give to this letter. And uh, he was sorry in a sense that he sent that letter. Maybe if he could have taken the letter back, he might have taken it back. But it was a letter that the Corinthian church needed. And this letter was inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, we have to understand that in the time of the Apostle Paul and all of the other apostles, when they were speaking, they didn't know that what they were saying was going to become Holy Scriptures. They didn't know that at that time. But God, he had them to speak uh, that way. That's the reason why the Bible tells us that God in sundry time and diverse places and diverse manner speak unto us by the prophets. But in these last days, he is speaking unto us by his son, Jesus Christ. So the apostle Paul, he was sorry. He feels sorry that he sent the letter off knowing he was worrying uh, concerning the reception that the Corinthians church will give to his letter. So he said, I do not repent, though I did repent. You know, the reason why he's saying here that um, he do not repent and he did repent is because he after he sent the letter off, he got word from Titus that the letter was well received. And uh, the brother in the church who was living with his father's wife he was disciplined. They disciplined him and they put him out of the church. And uh, the Corinthians church uh, received the letter and the Corinthians church, uh, uh, they, they, they were convicted because they, the Holy Spirit deal with them and let them know that they were offline. They were not in line with Holy Scriptures. So um, Paul is telling us, I, I, do I, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorrow, sorry, though it were but for a season. Now the word a season, it means one hour. It's a short time. When the Corinthians received the letter, they were upset and they were angry. But the Lord spoke to them and they were only um, upset and angry for a season. And the Holy Spirit moved upon them and caused them to, to change to see themselves, the, the word of God have a way of opening people's eyes. And we have to understand that rebuke, rebuke a lot of times is going to be painful. When you have to rebuke some people, you know, depending on who the person is, it's a painful thing. And sometimes it's a hard thing. But rebuke, it doesn't matter when it comes or who it comes from. It doesn't matter how painful it is. We have to be prepared to take it. And even though this was a painful letter, Paul had us to send it out because it was necessary. The Corinthians church need to hear um, uh, this truth. It was a hard truth that had us to be uh, digest. So they were sorry for a season, but after a while, the Spirit of God moved upon their heart and uh, the veil that was over their eyes, the plug that was in their ears was removed. And uh, the, the word of God break the rock in pieces. Their, their, their heart that was hardened by sin and disobedient was broken up. And uh, the apostle Paul continues, said in verse 9, Now I rejoice. So he was, you know, sorrowful when he sent out that letter. But when he heard the result of the letter, he heard what this letter did and the changes that was done. Uh, in the life of the Corinthians church, get the kids to sit down. If they're staying down, let them sit down. Let them sit down. Um, the changes, keep them, don't, don't keep all of them together. Uh, the, 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 the changes that was done in the Corinthians church, Paul is saying here in verse 9, now I rejoice. He was rejoiced. Not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrow. To repentance. So Paul is saying here, I'm not rejoicing. I'm not taking pleasure in the fact that, you know, you were, you were hurt. I didn't send this letter to, to hurt you. But what I'm rejoicing about is that your sorrow, it was conviction. And it leads you to repentance. 
and this is how we, we have to look at the word of God. When we read the word of God, the word of God must have an effect on our heart. It must have an effect on our life. The word of God must bring conviction upon us. You know, when we read the word of God and you are convicted, we're not supposed to rebuke it. Don't rebuke conviction. You know, you read the word of God, you do something wrong, and you read the word of God and you feel guilty. Don't say, Satan, I rebuke you. No, that is not Satan. When we do something wrong and uh, we read the word of God, or even though you don't actually take up the word of God, but you read it so many times and it's in your mind, in your heart, and a scripture come back to you and say, you know what you just did there, or what you just said there is wrong? That is not the devil. That is God. That is the Holy Spirit that is speaking to us. And uh, a lot of times we, 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 we will just, you know, push it away. But it is the Holy Spirit that is speaking to us. Praise the name of the Lord. Just like, you know, when you um, feel pain in your body. A lot of times, you know, people will experience some kind of pain in their body and they totally ignore it. You know how many times you hear uh, people uh, will have uh, some kind of pain in their shoulder or whatever area here close to their heart and they just push it away. And uh, maybe a few weeks after they go into the hospital when they have a, 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 a real heart attack and when they go into the hospital, doctors will say, you know, you have nine heart attacks already or maybe three or four heart attacks already. But they never really pay no attention to it. When you feel pain in your body, it's not something you're supposed to ignore. Your body is saying to you, pay some attention. Take notice. And the same thing when you are convicted, when your conscience, the Bible said that there's a spirit in man and by the inspiration of the Almighty God, give it an understanding. When your conscience is bugging you about something, when you feel convicted about something, it's not something you're supposed to ignore. It's not something you're supposed to push off. And uh, the Bible is saying here that Paul was rejoicing because of the fact that the Corinthians uh, was convicted, they were sorrowful, and that sorrow lead them to repentance. So we ought not to become just sorrowful. When we are, are guilty of something or when we are convicted of something, we need to take it a further step. Go further and repent and confess. The Bible said, if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. If we sin willfully, after we have come to the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. It tells us, for you were made sorrow, sorry, after a godly manner. This is the same thing I'm saying here. This sorrowfulness or this conviction that came upon the Corinthians church Paul is saying here, it is according to God's will. It is God who makes you feel sorrowful. It is God that caused that uh, conviction to come upon you. It is, it, it is godly sorrow. You know, it is sorrow after a godly manner. And it means that it was the will of God for Paul to send out that letter to them. Even though it was a painful letter, but it brought um, sorrow in their heart and the Corinthians church they repent it leads them to salvation praise the name of the Lord that ye might receive damage by us in nothing so what Paul is saying here the purpose for this letter and this epistle is to bring you to repentance so that you will receive damage in nothing and the word that damage means to suffer loss and Paul is saying here that he don't want the Corinthians church to, to, to suffer spiritual loss or to lose out on the blessings of God. You see, what was going on in the Corinthians church, it was division, it was immorality, it was all kinds of things that were not in line with the word of God. And because of the fact that all of these things was taking place in the lives of the members, the members were losing out on the blessings of God. And it's the same thing with us today. If we allow division, if we allow animosity to take over our heart, if you allow bitterness to live in your heart, you can't receive the blessings of God. You are robbing yourself. You are uh, 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 robbing yourself from uh, God's blessing. And this is what Paul is saying here. You are suffering loss. 
And Paul said that the reason for this letter is so that the uh, Corinthian church will not suffer loss. They will not lose out on their blessings. We as children of God, we need to examine ourselves consistently. The Bible said every man is supposed to examine himself to see whether or not they're in the faith. The Bible talks about, you know, if your right hand offend you, you're supposed to cut it off. Your right eye offend you, you're supposed to pluck it out. And we know what that means, what the scripture is talking about. If there's situations or circumstances in our life that is causing us to be robbed of our blessing, we need to take action. Could you imagine you go into the bank and when you look into your bank account, you see that the bank overcharging you? What are you going to say? Oh, you know, just the bank. You know, they need the money. And you just walk away. No, you're not going to do that. <laughs> you're going to try to get back your money. You're going to try to stop them from robbing you. So whatever is in our life that is causing us from not receiving God's blessing, each of us need to uh, take it away, remove it, make some changes. Praise the name of the Lord. So that we will not suffer loss. The Bible said that the blessings of the Lord make it rich. And he added no sorrow with it. Brethren, we can't live one day, one minute, one hour without God's blessing. Living without the blessing of God is living under the curse. If, you don't, if, you, if you're not receiving God's blessing, it means that you are under the curse. And uh, the, the song says he makes his blessing flow as far as the curse is found. And brethren, we have to remove all of these obstacles and hindrances to God's blessing from out of our lives so that the channel can be made clear so God can flow his blessings into our lives. In verse 10, he said, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. This is a big uh, scripture here to explain. Very powerful. For godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is the sorrow that is caused by the Holy Spirit. Is the sorrow or conviction. Is when a person is convicted by the Holy Spirit. Is when the Holy Spirit open up your eyes to something and show you that this thing is going on in your life. And you need to change and you need to repent. And it causes you to feel convicted. Causes you to feel sorrowful. The Bible call it godly sorrow. It is um, by the will of God. It caused because God allowed it to happen. It is according to God's will. And that is the reason why godly is attached there to sorrow. Godly sorrow means that it comes from God. And the Bible says it worketh uh, repentance to salvation. So don't just become sorrowful. You have to go a step further. And you have to repent. And repentance will take us to salvation. You know, repentance open up the door to uh, glory. Open up the door to the blessings of God. Godly sorrow work and repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of. When he said not to be repented of is that what he's saying at the end there. After you repent, you must not regret. Don't ever repent for sin. And then you look back and you regret uh, about repenting. That is what Paul is saying. Uh, a person cannot repent about something and then they regret that they repent about it. It's like, you know, persons who uh, repent of a certain lifestyle and then they find themselves going back into that same lifestyle. Uh, it's like regretting that you did repent. And it's like the Bible said, it's like the dog that um, returned to its own vomit. And it's like the sow or the pig that was once washed, go back to wallowing in the mud. So when we repent, brethren, we have to leave these things behind. Show them behind. Any man who is in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And what he said at the end of verse 10, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And here Paul is contrasting uh, godly sorrow with the sorrow of the world. There's a difference between godly sorrow and the sorrow of the world. Now godly sorrow is when the spirit of God brings conviction on a person 
and prompt them to repent. And that uh, uh, prompting to repent will lead them to salvation. Godly sorrow is according to the will of God. So then, what is the sorrow of the world? What is the sorrow of the world? You know, in plain speaking, the sorrow of the world is when somebody does something wrong and uh, they get caught. But they feel sorry that they get caught. They don't really feel sorry that they did something wrong and they want to make amends. You just feel sorry that, oh man, I, I feel so sorry that I get caught. You feel sorry that you get caught. That is what the sorrow of the world is. Sorrow of the world is like you invest some money and, you know, your uh, financial advisor give you a 649 and they rob you and you feel sorry. That is the sorrow of the world. The sorrow of the world in Bible terms is like what happened with Judas. You remember when Judas sold Christ for 30 pieces of silver? And then when he realized what he had done, that he sold the Messiah, the one who, the innocent blood, he betrayed innocent blood. What he did, he went back to the high priest and he told them and he was feeling so guilty and upset of what he done. Take the 30 pieces of silver and he threw it down and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And uh, Judas, he went out. He was guilty, he was convicted of what he had done. But what he did, did he repent? No, he went out and he hung himself. That is what um, the sorrow of the world is. Judas was feeling sorrowful. He was feeling caught up on the inside, but he didn't go to repentance. Now look at the difference. Peter, remember Peter? He also um, denied the Lord. And uh, the Lord told him that before the night was true, he was going to deny him three times. And when Peter... I realized what was happen, happening. He went out and the Bible said he wept bitterly. Peter wept bitterly. There's a difference between the sorrow that Peter was experiencing and the one that Judas was experiencing. Peter went out and he, he wept bitterly. He was sorrowful that he denied the Lord. But Judas, he went out and he hung himself. The Bible gave us another example about the rich young ruler. Remember when he went, this rich man, young man, went to Jesus and he said, Master, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus said to him, sell all of your riches and give to the poor. The Bible said that when the man, I guess he looked back and he see all the things, the material things that he'll have to give away. He was sad. He was sorrowful. And he went away sorrowful. That is what the sorrow of the world is. So here Paul is contrasting the sorrow that comes from the Holy Spirit that leads to repentance and the sorrow of the world in which a person just feels sorrowful because they get caught and they have to pay the price. And we as children of God, we can't be a part of the sorrow of the world. We have to allow the sorrow of God to work within our life. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world um, worketh death. So the sorrow of the world will lead us to death. This week it was on the radio that the Canadian government is very soon they're going to um, legalize doctor assisted suicide. Well, I call it suicide. Amen. <laughs> they're going to legalize that. I think it's sometime in June. I think it's the 6th of June or July somewhere there. Coming up soon, they're going to legalize that. And what they're saying is that anybody who have any kind of terminal disease and, uh, or you have some kind of reoccurring situation in your life and you feel that you can't take it anymore, you could go and discuss it with your doctor and your doctor recommend it to somebody else and they're going to, I guess, make arrangement to um, put the lights out. <laughs> they're even saying that, well, I guess that law will apply to people from 18 years and over. But they're talking about uh, making it available for even children. Some of these children who have uh, these uh, leukemia and all of these different diseases, they're saying that children are supposed to have the same opportunity. If they feel that they don't want to go on any longer, they can um, put the lights out. And they're saying that it should be applied also to um, people who are suffering mentally. People who have mental issues, they're saying that people like that, they should have the opportunity. 
When that is in force, a lot of abuse is going to take in place. And that is the time they're going to, they're going to really harvest body parts. You see, right now, right now, there's a lot of shortage of body parts. <laughs> I believe that will be used. That, well, is my opinion. <laughs> that will be used to gather in a lot of body parts. A lot of plasma, a lot of blood that they are short on right now. They will use that to get a lot of body parts, all of the different things that they, they need. I think it might, it, it, they have to be careful that they don't go down the road that um, Hitler was down, getting rid of all of these um, invalid uh, people and children who, you know, wasn't that well. He get rid of them. And uh, this is the kind of road I think that they probably might end up going down. But they have to be careful. So the Bible is talking about the sorrow of the world will work at death. Christians not supposed to reach to the point where they um, had to make arrangements to, to, to die. You know, well, we don't do that. Like an African brother at work was telling me, <laughs> he said, we as Christians, we believe in heaven and we want to go to heaven, but none of us want to die. Anytime we feel sick, we say, death, I rebuke you. I shall not die. I shall live. And we rebuke death and we don't want to die. And as soon as the unsaved person feels sick, they're ready to go. And they don't believe in heaven and they're ready to go. So uh, this doesn't really apply to us. We as children of God, it doesn't matter how sick we are, we still have hope. Because while you're alive, you have hope. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. That is the hope that the Lord gave to us. So he tells us in verse 11, For behold, this self same thing that you sorrow after a godly sod. He's talking about uh, the letter that he wrote to them that caused them to repent. The self same thing. That same thing that caused you to repent and become so sorrowful. Hear what Paul said. What carefulness is he, he, he's talking about the kind of character that was built in the Corinthians membership because of that painful letter. What carefulness or diligence. It's like it started a revival. It turned over. Uh, there was a, a turning upside down within the life of the Corinthians uh, membership. Their lives were, were, were turned upside down, inside out. It's like uh, the Spirit of God caused a change, a revival to take place in the hearts of those um, disobedient um, Corinthians members. He said, what carefulness. It worked in you. It turned your life upside down. Yea, what um, clearing of yourself. So what he's saying here, the, the Corinthians, they wanted to come clear. They didn't have nothing to hide anymore. They're not holding back. They're not hiding anything, they, everything, the mask was taken off. That um, letter that the Holy Spirit used, it ripped the mask off from the face, the faces of the Corinthians church. And they want to come clear with everything. And that is how conviction operates. That is how the Holy Spirit operates. When you are born again, you don't hide nothing. You know, we as children of God, we're not supposed to have anything in secret. You know, you're not supposed to have nothing in closet. You know, anything sinful in the closet, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes it might come out. No, we're not supposed to operate like that. We're supposed to operate in the clear. Praise the name of the Lord. So they, they want to come clear. They want to clear themselves. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, what, uh, it said, um, yea, what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation. Indignation means you become angry and they become angry over sin. When the Corinthians look back and they see how the devil was messing them up and see how the devil was beating them and they're allowing the devil to mess up their life, they become angry. They say, hey, look at how we allow him to mess us up. We allow the devil to sow seed of hatred in our hearts against our spiritual father. And they look back and they become angry with their condition. How can we allow that to happen? Yea, what fear. So they even, they, they, they have fear for God. And some interpreters believe that um, this also could be referring to uh, their respect for the Apostle Paul return. Because they lost respect for the Apostle Paul. It's a bad thing when you lost respect for your, your pastor, for your man of God. You know, um, a lot of times uh, when you have uh, ordinary pastors, you know, um, village boy pastors, so to speak. 
Some people don't like to respect village boy pastor because of the fact that all of them grew up in the same village. We all grew up roasting breadfruit and, you know, planting, you know, uh, on the, the, the barn fire. Some people think, well, you know, we, I can't respect him. No, that is the man you're supposed to respect. And uh, the highfalutin pastor who wants you to bring a thousand dollars, see the faith. <laughs> Those are the ones that get in all of the, re the respect. But the man who is down to earth, who you can call anytime, and you can talk to him, just like how you talk to a friend. You know, those are the ones people tend to want to abuse and disrespect. And it seems as though Paul was a down to earth kind of man. He was a highfalutin man. Paul was a man who was working. He wasn't depending on anybody to, 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 to um, support him. He was working with his own hands. And it seems as though they're disrespecting him. So this letter caused them to, to rethink what was going on in their life. And uh, their, their, their respect for the Apostle Paul and their fear for God returned. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. So all of that talking about zeal and desire. Their zeal for God. Their zeal for the things of God. You know, our zeal for God need to be stored up. We need to be excited about the Lord. As you talk about zeal here, a few, I think it was a few months ago I was talking here and I was saying about the way how we attend church. We come in anytime and, you know, we come in so late and then, you know, um, the next Sunday, you know, I didn't expect that there was a change going to take place. I came in here maybe, um, I don't know, maybe five minutes past 10 or maybe just 10 o'clock. Sorry, it's 10 o'clock. Yes, 10 o'clock we start. Yes, 10 o'clock. And I was surprised when I opened the door. I see everybody here. So the next week, I came back expecting to see everybody here. No, it only happened one time. <laughs> the zeal of the people gets stored up that one time. And then everybody go right back to their old place. By the way, brethren, we have to do better. We have to do better. We can't give God um, that kind of service. We have to give him the best. Praise God. Hallelujah. Give God the best. You know, when, when is this Saturday night come? It doesn't matter what's going on on TV. When Saturday night come, I on my bed. I up in my room getting ready to go to bed because I know I had to, I had to get up early in the morning. I get up sometimes 5 o'clock, 5.30 and start studying and preparing. I don't allow nothing to interfere with that. Praise the name of the Lord. It's the same thing when I'm going to work. When I'm going to work, sometimes my wife, she down there watching TV. And 8.30 I go on to bed. I, I tired. I down there a little bit with her and my eyes can't stay open. 8.30, I gone on my seti, amen, <laughs> and I sleep, and then when 4 o'clock come, I don't use alarm clock to get up. I don't have no alarm clock. Once I go to bed, my, my special time, when the time come, I just get right up, and I'm ready to go. Praise the name of the Lord. So we have to give God the best. Praise God. Amen. Picking up from what we're saying here. Praise God. Amen. And he said, in all things, ye have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. So what Paul is saying here, that in all things, all what was taking place in the Corinthians church, the Corinthians church, they proved to themselves that it was the false prophets, the false apostles who was instigating them to um, hate the apostle Paul and to, 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 to say these things against the apostle Paul. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. In verse 12, wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffer wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. So what Paul is saying here, this is not a vindictive letter. I didn't send this letter because I am taking the side of the person who was wrong and uh, the person who or I was taking the side of the person who suffer wrong. And we have to be careful when we as leaders dealing with situation in the church, we have to be careful that we don't take side. It's a dangerous thing when you dealing with church matters and you want to be on anybody's side. I was listening uh, a while back to this pastor who was talking about, he was doing some marriage counseling and uh, he was counseling the husband and wife, and uh, I guess the husband was in the wrong, and he pointed out to the husband, you see what you're doing there, that is wrong. And the wife, she loved that. So when they were in the parking lot, the wife pulled out 
a, a envelope with a, a sum of money and she passed it to the pastor. You know, meaning that he, he's on her side. Pastor can't take that. No, he's not supposed to take no side. He wasn't taking side. And sometimes people think, you know, you, you, you want to take side. And we have to be careful that when we're dealing with these things that we don't take side. No, it's dangerous to be on the highway. Break down on the highway and on the side of the road. It's dangerous just to be on the highway on the side of the world. Much less, if you go and stand up in the center of the highway, you're asking for your debt. And a lot of times people, they're saying, well, me, I don't want to take no side. And all they want to do, they want to stand in the side of the road. You can't stand in the middle of the road. You have to be on the side where truth is. Praise the name of the Lord. It doesn't matter who get hurt. You have to be on the side where truth is. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. And, and truth sometimes could become a bitter medicine. And some people can't handle bitter medicine. But when you're in a position, when God put you in that place, and you have to give out bitter medicine, you have to give it out. Most medicine that work, they're not sweet, you know. Anybody ever drink Berkeley's? <laughs> Berkeley's does work. <laughs> Man, if you have the cold, go home and drink some Berkeley's. It tastes nice. <laughs> Man, I think they're making it in tablets form now <laughs> for people who don't want the bad taste. But if I'm going to take it, I'm going to take the bad taste in one because I think it works. Praise the Lord. So medicine at times is going to be bitter. We can't stand in the center of the road. We have to rightly divide the word of God, the word of truth. But he said, uh, Paul said, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. So Paul is saying here, the reason why he sent this letter is so that unity could be experienced in the church. And what he's saying here, he wants the Corinthians people to see themselves. Because the Corinthians church, even though they were acting like they hate Paul, deep down in their heart, they love the apostle. But it seems as though the bitterness that the false apostles stir up in their heart cause them to be blinded and uh, they were talking as if they hate Paul but deep down within their heart they love the apostle Paul because when this letter came the letter peel off all of that hatred and bitterness that they have for the apostle Paul and it uncovered that they really in love with, with him you know it's like a wife or husband who um you know, after years and years living together, they despise each other. And they have en uh, hatred within their heart. They have bitterness towards one another and, uh, and so on. But you know, deep down in that husband heart, deep down in that wife heart, there is a genuine love down there. But you know what happened? It's bitterness. Bitterness is on top. And if that bitterness could be peeled away, the love that the husband has for that wife is right there. And if that bitterness could be peeled away, the love that that wife has for the husband is there. It's the same thing with children. Children hate their parents. Take away that, you know, uh, time when they come to the father, to the mother, and say, Dad, I need a thousand dollars. And dad say, I don't have a thousand dollars. They go to mama and say, Mom, I need a thousand dollars. Because when they come and they say they want a thousand dollars, you have to have a thousand dollars to give them, you know. Otherwise, you write down in their um, black book. And if you can take away that um, thing that they have there about the thousand dollars thing, deep down within the heart, underneath, deep down in the heart, that child don't hate the parents. It's just that they didn't get the thousand dollars. And the thousand dollars caused animosity to be built up. So what happens is that um, the letter, the painful letter, it peel away. You know, the, the, the bitterness that the Corinthians church had for the Apostle Paul, and they were able to see no, we don't really hate Paul. Paul is our spiritual father. And this is what Paul is saying. Therefore, in verse 13, we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly the more joy we for uh, the joy of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by you. So Paul is saying here, when he hear about what was going on and he hear how the Corinthians church received the letter joyfully, he was comforted in their comfort. He was rejoicing with them. And we have to learn to rejoice with people. When people are rejoicing, we have to rejoice with them. When things are working out for people, rejoice. Even though things aren't working out for you, still rejoice. And Paul was rejoicing. 
And he said he was exceedingly the more joy for the joy of Titus. Titus, Titus, the one that delivered the letter. Some people think Paul was afraid to go, so he sent Titus. <laughs> so that because they already, they already abused Paul, and Paul didn't want to go back. Uh, so he sent Titus, and Titus, and even Paul probably was surprised that the Corinthians just received Titus in such a way. You know, and he said, because his spirit was refreshed by you. They received Titus with open arms, and they refreshed Titus' spirit. And that is what, brethren, we need to do to each other. We need to refresh one another. Praise the name of the Lord. Stir up each other. Provoke one another unto love. For in verse 14, he said, For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we sp uh, spoke all things to you in truth, even so, our boasting which I made before Titus is found a truth. So what Paul is saying here, even before he sent Titus, Paul, like he was boasting on the Corinthians church, and he was saying, I believe that this Corinthians church um, is because of the false teachers, why they are reacting that way towards me. They're not showing me any love. But I believe deep down within their heart, they uh, have, they're, they're genuinely born again. They are believers. They are children of God. And Paul was speaking good things. He was speaking faith, you know, in regards to the Corinthians church. He was boasting on them, even though they were um, mounting him off and saying all of these things about him. Paul was still speaking good things. He was boasting about them. He, he had faith and trust that the Lord was going to turn them around, and the Lord did. In verse uh, 15 and 16, as we close, and his inward, aff um, and his inward affection is more abundant towards you, while he remembered the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you receive him. So what Paul is saying here, when Titus went to Corinth, the Corinthian church received him with open arms, and in return, remember Paul was telling them that he was pouring out his love towards them, but they wasn't returning any love towards Paul. So here we see that the Corinthians, when uh, Titus went over there with this letter, the Corinthians church pour out their love upon Titus. And because of that, Titus said that, and his inward affection uh, is more abundant towards you. And when you talk about the inward affection, he's talking about loving somebody from the inside. Inward affection has to do with the inward organs, like your heart. It means loving somebody from the heart. And brethren, we have to practice to love people from the heart. When you love somebody from the heart, when they mess up, and they will mess up. When you love somebody from the heart, when they mess up, you have room in your heart to forgive them. And that's the reason why a lot of people find it hard to forgive. And hear people saying, I can't forgive, no, I can't forgive. And they boast and they beat their chest and say, I can't forgive. If you can't forgive, you're sour. And if you can't forgive, you're unforgiven. If you can't forgive, you're not born again. When we boast and say that we can't forgive, it means that we don't have no part with God. If you can't forgive, all your sins is on you. All your sins is like a heavy burden on you. When you forgive somebody, what you're doing, you're taking all of your heavy weight and you throw it off. The Bible talks about when you um, um, do good to your enemy, what you're doing, you're heaping coals of fire upon their head. So, uh, Titus loved the Corinthians from the inside, brethren. And we have to learn to love one another from the inside. Because as I said before, each of us is going to mess up. And we're going to do, we'll, we'll fall out of favor with each other. But when we love each other from the inside, the Bible said that love will cover a multitude of sin. Love is like a blanket that will cover up things. It will expose it. Amen. Praise the Lord. And this is what Titus was doing here, loving the Corinthians church from his inward part, from his heart. And uh, the scripture said in verse 16, in, in closing, I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. This is talking about the Corinthians church. Paul is saying here that the letter performs such a change in them that he have confidence in them in all things. And... Sometimes you hear people say, well, me not trust nobody, no? I don't have no confidence in nobody. 
And it is wrong to live that way. You know, even though you were hurt by people. And brethren, even though you were hurt by people, people will continue to hurt us. Once you continue to love people, you are going to be hurt again. You, I talked about that a few weeks ago. Once you continue to be in relationship with people, whether it's your husband or your wife or your friend or your brother or your sister, you are going to be hurt again. Me and my wife together for how much? Uh, 36, 37 years. And we hurt each other already. You know, we get over it. it hurt, you're going to come up again. Honey, hurt, time, you're going to come up again. You know, we don't know when it's going to come up. But, you know, because of the fact that we love each other and it's the same thing. Anybody who you're in love with, you know, as you go along, hurt will come. Sometimes you don't really mean to hurt the person. And sometimes we act like children, you know, children, you know, they play and don't, they don't even know when they're hurting you. And that is the way it is sometimes. So that's the reason why we have to, you see all the elder looking at the wife right in, in, in her face? Amen. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> yes, we, you know, once we are in relationship, we are going to hurt one another. And it's not because we plan to do it. And we have to learn to deal with it when it happens, brethren. So therefore, we can't say that we don't trust people and I don't trust nobody. You know, all, everybody is the same and everybody will keep, they keep hurting you. Yes, you're going to continue to get hurt. But as you get hurt, you continue to forgive. And you continue to move on. Praise the name of the Lord. If you don't forgive, your life is going to be most unhappy. The most forgiving people who forgive, they relax. People who forgive, they sleep at night and they sleep comfortable. If you're not sleeping good at night, check your forgiveness. Check your unforgiveness record and see. And forgive. And God, the Bible says he gave his beloved sleep. May the Lord bless us. I'm going to ask the musicians to come back. Praise the Lord. Could you find that song, um, Until Then, Andel, please?